this week we're moving into the mental illness in the prison population and we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about uh, mental illness in the jail so some of this is going to overlap this is a pretty long presentation so I'm not going to read every slide you can do that on your own I'm just going to touch on the most important parts of this We talked about before about crisis driving policy, and again, we're going to see this, especially when we're talking about incarceration in prisons. As noted by Vitellio, public policy has been significantly influenced by anecdotes and exceptional news headlines, contributing to increases in the incarceration of persons with mental illness. I just wanted to, to, to read that because I think it kind of um, summarizes what we're talking about. Trans institutionalization. This is from state hop when you when they when a person with a mental illness moves from state hospitals to the custody of the criminal justice system, possibly due to you know what we've talked about before, the deinstitutionalization, the restriction of civil commitment crime criteria. They do not meet that criteria, the ease of police placement of persons with a mental illness in jails, and a significant decrease in the number of long-term commitments. As noted by uh, Inglot, persons with a serious mental illnesses are three times more likely than those without to be incarcerated. Also, as indicated by, by research, individuals with a mental illness are three times more likely to be in the criminal justice system than hospitals. And we, as we've noted before, this is because of the deinstitutionalization. This is what we talked about. Uh, what do we do with them? They're being dumped on uh, the jails and the, the prisons. Wilper and Associates found that 26% of federal inmates and 30% of state inmates had been taking medication for their illness at the time of arrest. <clears throat> and I want to note too that these are very low numbers because this doesn't indicate those that are having that have a mental illness those are just those that are taking medication and the rates of recent mental health history within the past year from from time of analysis range from 7 to 45 percent of federal inmates and 16 to 56 of state inmates that have problems acknowledged it's just some more some uh, more uh, percentages that I'll let you uh, look over. It's been said that prisons are more concerned about assessing risk and maintaining security than ensuring appropriate treatment for, for prisoners. And, and this is extremely true. We see this. When compared, when, uh, when compared to those without a mental illness, persons with a mental illness, the, the mentally ill prisoners, they get sicker, stay longer, suffer more, and wind up back in prison sooner after their release. Which is the same thing that we saw with those in jails. Ditton reported that inmates with the mental illnesses serve sentences that are approximately 15 months longer than other state prisoners for the reasons that we've discussed before. Uh, those with a mental illness have a higher than average disciplinary rates. Mental illness is consistently not considered a factor in the disciplinary proceedings, but it's very hard to overlook. And many mental ill inmates end up serving their maximum sentence. For example, inmates with the mental illnesses in Pennsylvania were found to be three times more likely to serve their maximum sentences than inmates without. In some cases, inmates with a mental illness serve even longer than their original prison sentence. Same thing we saw with jails. For example, an inmate in Ohio who was profiled in the documentary, The New Asylums, he served 13 years on a three-year sentence. And this is usually because they're, they're receiving additional charges against one that for crimes that they commit while incarcerated. The same thing um, within their, when they're in jails. And this is because of, we talked about that you know, being incarcerated exasperates uh, their symptoms. It increases their risk of acting out. Inmates and correctional officers are often annoyed by, abusive to, and or avoid inmates with a mental illness. They just don't want to deal with them. Some inmates and even some staff target those inmates with a mental illness. You know, as we've talked about, those with a mental illness are seen as weak, different, and they usually are the, the victim of these predators. Male inmates with a mental illness have been found to be slightly more likely to be physically assaulted by staff. 
than inmates without a mental illness. And inmates with mental illnesses have been found slightly more likely to be sexually assaulted by a staff member, staff member than inmates without a mental illness. And it looks back to the reasons we just talked about that they're considered, um, trying to find it, they're considered uh, weaker and easier, uh, or considered easier prey. The rates of physical victimization at the hands of other inmates has been found to be two times as high as sexual victimization and three times as high for inmates with a mental illness. Antipsychotic medication can slow physical reaction times and it can also make the inmates uh, especially susceptible to victimization. This is because, as we said, their speech might be slower. They may not be able to react as quickly and so therefore they're seen as weaker. As indicated by Rich, an increased use of psychotropic, psychotropic medication within prisons is not necessarily a positive sign for treatment of mentally ill inmates, as medication is sometimes used to just sedate inmates and is acting as chemical restraints. So it's not really um, helping the person with a mental illness, and it's not uh, um, positive for treatment when, when there's other more positive, adequate um treatment um, outcomes. And as we've talked about numerous times in this class, and you'll see probably on your final, and you know, we're talking again about stigma. So inmates in treatment are doubly stigmatized by other inmates. Not only are they stigmatized for their mental illness, but for being, you know, weak or pathetic because they're participating in treatment. And of course, we know that we don't no inmates wants no inmate wants to be seen as weak within excuse me the prison system prisons fail to adequately screen inmates the same as they do in jails for mental illness prisons fail to offer special programming or housing prisons often fail to provide basic treatment they fail to address special needs upon release <clears throat> again we talk about the screening of inmates the importance of this 85% or above of all correctional mental health chief administrators reported using standardized mental illness screening instruments to identify inmates with a mental illness at the outset. Imagine the problems with that. Research also has, has studied suicides in the largest prison system in the U.S., which is Texas, between uh, September 2006 and 2007, and found that just over 50% of the inmates who committed suicide uh, had a serious mental illness. Every institution reporting identified using each of the following methods in an attempt to prevent suicides from occurring. Suicide watch, safety smocks and blankets, and medication. Prisoners with a mental illness have been known to smear feces on themselves, slash themselves, sticks objects in their penises, bite chunks of flesh from their bodies. These are all indicators of a severe mental illness. Also, self-injurious in, in behavior includes headbanging, cutting, burning, ingesting or inserting objects into one's body, self-amputation and hitting. Just imagine what we talked about a minute ago that anyone that appears weak in the, in the prison system is going to become a, a prey, is going to become a victim. And when they are doing these behaviors, the other inmates are seeing them as different and weak. And even though these persons with a mental illness many times cannot stop this behavior, they're therefore, they're targeted even more. Self-mutilation and injurious behavior does not include tattooing, piercing, and autoerotic auto -erotic acts. Uh, one of the inmates, um, he engaged in all of these uh, self-injurious behaviors such as he amputated fingers, he removed a testicle, he amputated his earlobes, and he cut his Achilles tendon. Ouch! So what is the difference when, or what comparing and contrasting self-mutilation versus suicide when it happens? Inmates with a mental illness are also at a risk for self-injurious behavior, which is not the same as suicidal behavior. When inmates or anyone self-mutilates and harms themselves, they're doing it because the pain within inside of them is so much stronger than the pain they're inflicting. And they do this because it helps, it helps relieve the pain inside. And although someone may die from self-mutilation due to the lack of intent, it's not considered suicidal behavior. <clears throat> 
Inmates tend to engage in self-injurious behavior for purposes of self-soothing and are attempting to establish control over something, their body, in an environment, environment which they have very little control. So you see more of the self-injurious behavior uh, for persons with a mental illness that are incarcerated. The majority of cases of those that self mutilate in prison involve those with a personality disorder uh, and not necessarily just a persons with a mood disorder. It is not uncommon for a, uh, for a psychotic inmate to also have a personality disorder such as antisocial personality disorder. Since it happens with such regularly, correctional officers have been desensitized. You know, they see it so much, they just walk by and ignore it. And they come to view this behavior as part of the inmates being manipulative and attention-seeking. And therefore, what do they do? They just ignore it. An apple bomb in a study of prisons found that only 32% of prisons reported having policies in place in order to specifically respond to those that do self-injuries. It's been maintained by Craig Haney and others that confinement in supermax prisons and supermax units within the prison can exasperate mental health problems. We talked about this before, and this has to do with solitary confinement. Um, for example, rules require that no prisoners in the supermax unit that Jack, Jack Powers was housed in were to be given psychotropic medication regardless of how badly they needed it. Just imagine having a psychotic disorder, having um, a mental health diagnosis, especially uh, one of claustrophobia, and they're confined in, the, in, a, in a solitary confinement, and it's even sometimes in solitary, they're in there 23 hours a day. Um, and so just imagine and not being able to have any medication to help regulate. It's just going to uh, increase their behaviors and increase their mental illness. There was, a, there was a lawsuit because of this that alleged that the Federal Bureau of Prison Authorities typically place incoming prisoners who are on psychotropic medication in the control unit where the medication is actually prohibited and therefore they discontinue its use. So what are they doing? They're going against doctor's orders because of, of their guidelines. Uh, both Powers and Bacote were being housed in the ADX Florence supermax facility and it's said to be the most famous and secure federal supermax prison in America. Richard Street, he's another example. He died by hanging. He called himself Jesus Christ, future king of the vampires. Uh, the case of Madrid versus Gomez in 95 where the court determined that inmates with the mental illnesses they should be banned from placement in supermax at Pelican Bay in California. The acronym SHU at Pelican Bay stands for Security Housing Unit. Many times what we see is these persons with a mental illness and even persons uh, with disorders are placed into these security housing units and they're, they are then confined really 24 hours a day and they do, they say this is for their own security and for others but what are we doing again? We're putting them in solitary and we are again exasperating uh, their behaviors and, and their mental illness. Mississippi and Illinois have reportedly closed their supermax facilities. Warden's views on supermax. Uh, these wardens um, of the prisons acknowledge that supermax confinement diminishes mental health and increases suicide. I also report that mentally ill inmates who are placed in these isolation units receive little to no appropriate treatment services. And however, in a national survey, it was determined that the majority of wardens are in favor of supermax type facilities, supporting them grounds why they increase safety, order, and control and they are useful in incapacitating violent and disruptive inmates. We can't control these inmates. They won't behave, so we're going to put them in these supermax facilities in these solitary confinement. As always, when we're looking at anything in the criminal justice system, we're looking at um, the comparison of cost versus success. And what what has been found out is that these supermax prisons um, it's unclear whether they reduce violence in the general prison population so in other words they're they're not doing what they're intended to do and the cost of these supermax facilities are actually higher than uh, a general population prison <clears throat> 
According to the National Corrections, only seven states reportedly provide correctional officers with more than four hours of training on dealing with mental illness issues. Remember, we've talked about before, and we've talked about this over and over, and it's been, many of you have uh, note this within your um, discussions, the importance of training. And these officers, especially at the prison level, when they're dealing with, with inmates at a higher level of violence, they got they, they've got to have training because what we see in research uh, through other means instead of this class, but those that are violent, there's a high percentage that have a mental illness. And if we can't deal with them, we're putting them in prison again just to house them. We're not doing anything to help them with treatment or help with recidivism. Crisis intervention teams usage is reportedly gaining in popularity. We've seen this before with um, the types of interactions and the types of uh, crisis intervention teams in law enforcement and prison uh, corrections. The Oklahoma Department of Corrections reportedly trains both correctional officers and probation officers and calls their CIT training CCRT training. Um, researchers estimate that 15 to 20 percent of prisoners incarcerated will require some form of psychiatric intervention during their interact in their incarceration and those are not that are coming in with a mental illness inmates in prisons have a limited legal right to a treatment grounded in the eighth amendment with regard to mental illness specifically uh, most courts have agreed that serious mental illnesses such as bipolar schizophrenia major depressive disorder qualify as a serious medical need Almost all prisoners are eventually released back into the community, and the majority of inmates housed in Supermax will return to the free society. So what are we doing when we're putting them in solitary in Supermax? We're taking them away from the general population because they're not able um, to control themselves. They're not able um, to abide by the rules. But if we keep them in, in maximum security and then we let them out into the, to society, what are we doing? What, are, are we not increasing their their risk at, at more violent behavior? In Wakefield versus Thomas, the court held that the state's obligation to provide medical care to prisoners does not end immediately upon their release. We talked about this before about when should re-entry uh, occur the first day of incarceration. We talked about this with in jails. It's the same. It's even more so within our prisons that. You know, we've we've noticed that before that there's there's no overlap. So now we know that there has to be overlap, where when a um, inmate, especially those with a mental illness or anyone on medication, when they leave um, uh, custody, that they've got to be given assistance within the community. And many times, what we see is uh, the the prison will give them three weeks of medication and phone numbers. Here, go and talk to these people and find more medication. Well as we know, many of them are not going to follow through with that. Okay, I'm not going to do this. Some more research. Uh, stabilization and maintaining care. The goal of most correctional health systems is to merely stabilize the patient and to facilitate the maintenance of the mentally ill inmate into the general population. And this minimizes the need for limited and specialized services. Taking care of the offender living with a mental illness enhances not only the order and functioning of the prison environment, it reduces officer and inmate assaults and increases the chance of successful reentry. Treatment in prison and transitional services to include implementation of effective discharge plans reduces the possibility that an inmate will reoffend. And it actually is shown that prisons realize as nearly as 90% 90, 90 of all the CMHA surveyed by researchers indicated they provide pre-release transitional services. It decreases recidivism, so why not do it? The U.S. Supreme Court recognized in Estelle versus Gamble the right to treatment for serious medical need by indicating that deliberate indifference by prison personnel to a prisoner's serious illness or injury constitutes cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment. Another case you can review, uh, the mental health staff, correctional executives have difficult recruiting and hiring mental health professionals who are willing to work in prisons. Again, we talk about profit, profit how much it's going to cost, 
versus public safety. And we're looking at the privatization of, of prison hospitals and of, I'm sorry, the privatization of prisons that these critics of, of this type of health care maintain that private firms focus more on profit and not on public safety. Blevins and Soderstrom uh, found that 66 percent or less of annual state budgets were spent on mental health services. And it, you can see this in, in Table 1 within your textbook. Fellner contends that only the wealthy have access to mental health services in the community and many prisoners could have avoided expensive incarceration had publicly funded treatment been available. And we see this. If those within a community can get help, and especially they can do this through the mental health courts, but if they can get help within the community, it will prevent incarceration. ACT treatment, this is, uh, we talked about this before, this would allow community treatment teams to do, uh, to make home visits, administer medication, and provide in-home care. And according to, to SADL, it could reduce re-hospitalization of persons with a mental illness by 80%. Knowing these figures, it, it's, it's still confusing as to why we're not doing this more. Oops. There we go. 